Hello, uh, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Seth Manukin. I'm the director of the Communications Forum. Before we start, there is a sign-up sheet over there on that table with a writing utensil on top of it. Um, we do these events six times a year, three times per semester. Uh, and if you put your name down on that list, we will only email you for those <coughs> events. We will not email you for anything else or give your email away to anyone else. So uh, if you want to find out about these events, that is a very effective way to do that. Uh, um, tonight's event will function like all communication forums. Um, there'll be, we'll start out with a moderated conversation uh, and then we will go to an audience Q&A. Uh, we also have three of Kevin's books on sale here. And as someone who has read all three of them, uh, I can attest that they are all great and well worth your time and money. Uh, so please buy away afterwards. Um, so uh, Kevin Young is uh, an old friend of mine um, and the poetry editor of The New Yorker and the director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture at the New York Public Library. He's the author, frighteningly, of 13 books of poetry and prose. <laughs> I know, right? Right? <laughs> Chill out, man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> including, uh, including Blue Laws, Selected and Uncollected Poems from 1999-2015, which was long listed for National Book Award. His 2003 poetry collection, Jelly Roll of Blues, was a finalist for the National Book Award and the Los Angeles Times Books, Book Prize. And his most recent nonfiction book is Bunk, The Rise of Hoaxes, Humbug, Plagiarist, Phonies, Post Facts, and Fake News. And it was also long listed for the National Book Award and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle. Carol Bell is an assistant professor of communication studies and affiliated faculty in political science at Northeastern University. Uh, Bell's teaching and research focuses on the intersections of media, politics, public opinion, and public policy, with a particular focus on issues of social identity. Her first book, The Politics of Interracial Romance in American Film, is forthcoming from Rutledge. Uh, this communications forum is also sponsored uh, by Radius at MIT, uh, for which we are very grateful. Um, and with that, I will leave it to you two. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Hi. Thank you so much for coming out, and thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I am excited to talk about this book. Okay, so I was thinking we could start at the beginning. Um, this book is deeply speaking history. It begins in the 19th century uh, with P.T. Barnum, but it also feels strangely timely. Uh, but given how much history there is in this book, I know that you didn't start writing it yesterday. So can you talk a little bit about when you did get the first idea, when you first had the idea, um, first became interested in hoaxes, and then first sort of like decided to actually write about it? Oh, well, yeah, thank you. It's so good to see you. Um, and thanks, Seth, for inviting me. And um, Seth actually makes an appearance in the book, not as a hoaxer, but uh, as a, a cover of hoaxes, mm -hmm. which I'm sure we'll mention. But um, in a way, I was interested the, the way we all are in kind of fakers and con men, which is, I think, a very American thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I started writing in earnest what became the book, um, I guess about six years ago, when I had finished the Grey Album, and part of that you know, book was thinking about lying as a positive thing, uh, lying as part of African-American culture. Um, and I, by that, I mean that lies in black culture are another one name for folk tales, like we were up late last night telling lies. Um, and Zora Neale Hurston writes about that, and so does Ralph Ellison. And so I had thought about that a lot and, and the way that it corresponded to what I end up calling the storying tradition, this idea of telling a story. Because in Louisiana, and my mom's here, so uh, give a wave, mom. <laughs> Louisiana zone and, and Mass uh, Mattapan and uh, JP zone. Um, but you know, if you're down in Louisiana, you couldn't say to your cousin, much less a grown up, like, you lie. Mm -hmm. You would have to say, you story. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking about that. You know, what's it mean to story? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Louis Armstrong solo tells a story. And so this idea of storying as improvisation. But then when I finished that, I realized that there was you know, a bad side to lying, apparently. And so I, I um, had these, these sort of ruminations on uh, fake memoirs, especially. And I started thinking, well, what, 
are fake memoirs really about? Because people often say hoaxes or fakery is about sort of this blurry line between fact and fiction, which I always thought was bunk. Right. And um, I realized that they were about something else mm -hmm. and something more nefarious, and that sadly something more American, which is to say race. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's how I started thinking in earnest. Um, I, there's ways to go back even further than that, but um, that's how I started writing about mm -hmm. six, seven years ago now. It's interesting, you're talking about how lies uh, or storytelling is part of African American culture, but when I think about it, I also think about the place of lies in sort of like an, an outsider telling the story of Africans, right? Sure. Um, which is a lot of what happens here. But before you move on to that, can you talk a little bit about that first inspiration sort of years ago? Yeah, I mean, in college, um, I worked at Let's Go as part of Harvard. Uh -huh. um, and uh, editing this travel guide, which of course, you know, facts really matter. Right. And you'd get letters from people that said like, we were number one in the listing for, you know, Taos, mm -hmm. and now we're number two, and I've lost a million dollars. You know, it was like this crazy power you had yeah. just by ranking people, so you, you took it really seriously. Uh, meanwhile, there was a managing editor at the time, and he uh, came in one day and he said, you know, I have cancer, and he mm -hmm. broke up. And we were very upset, you know, everyone was, didn't know what to do, and his head was like bald like two days later. Mm. And looking back on it, I was like, that's not how it works if you have chemo or cancer. Right. And then he went on, I learned later, to hoax a lot of people. Uh, he pledged money, uh, he hoaxed Slate Magazine a couple times, he hoaxed the um, uh, University of Oregon promising tens of millions of dollars that he didn't give, though they threw him a big party. Um, and so I realized, just going back, that you know, we had known this hoaxer. Um, and it really brought home personally how that, what I call de-hoaxing in the book, mm -hmm. uh, process is, is really a shock to the system. Um, and so you, know, you have to filter back through. And I was like, oh, wait, so I know he was lying about X, Y, and Z. Oh, was he lying about cancer? You know? wow. um, and that, I think that kind of destabilization also was somewhere behind that. Um, and he used to open the book, but then now he's in the middle. Oh, interesting. So that's another interesting point. So the book actually starts with P.T. Barnum. So at one point in the process, did you shift? Because he becomes such an essential, central character sure. in this. Uh, so how did that come about? Yeah, I think it really helped to realize that there would be these characters in the book. Um, I think at one point, um, it happened in the middle, you know, and um, I realized that I think I was fighting a long time that it was a history, mm -hmm. um, and that mm -hmm. was kind of wild um, to realize that it was this history and not just, you know, um, a story of a bunch of different hoaxes. Right. Um, and I was really resistant to it um, just because I, I'm not a historian. I didn't feel like um, that meant something else to me, but what it really helped is once I realized that is that I got to tell the story uh, of the hoax uh, and really the uh, kind of biography of an idea. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that now its biography is wildly everywhere, <laughs> um, you know, mm -hmm. is, is an interesting thing. Uh, I was just riding over here in the cab and watching on our little tyrannical devices, mm -hmm. um, you know, a rant about fake news from someone's president, so. Oh. <laughs> We'll get to that. Oh, okay. and, uh, but and you know, it, went, it started with Barnum, and that really helped because yeah. I realized it was an American story. It was a story that, uh, you know, had a lot to do with entertainment, with what he called humbug, mm -hmm. um, but then also had to do with where we are now. Mm -hmm. So P.G. Barnum is most famous for spectacle, right? Yeah. For being a great showman, but in this book, you know, I'm sort of embarrassed to realize that I had only known him for that and that I had, you know, honestly one of my earliest memories is going to the circus, Barnum and Bailey Circus with my dad. And after reading this, I felt almost um, really ambivalent and almost ashamed that I didn't know um, this other side of him. But of course there's a reason, right? I don't sure. know this other side of him. Um, so could you talk a little bit about his story and, and how, uh, the, sort of the role that he, he plays? Yeah, Barnum, I think it's a fascinating figure. I mean, he is, I think, still one of the greatest uh, entertainers and certainly captured something about American life start in the 19th century and the mm -hmm. fact that he lived so long across the century and worked so long. Um, 
I think gives rise to a lot of things. I mean, he pretty much invented the circus. He certainly changed the, the museum, which used to be a kind of private enterprise, um, to the kind of public enterprise we think of, though. A museum in Barnum's day, he had a thing called the American Museum, which he maintained for a long time. And partially, he bought that from a gentleman named Peel, who's in Peel's mm -hmm. museum was sort of the first trying to show natural history and the advance of civilization. And he almost kind of purposely, he had to buy Peel's museum, and then he just dis disassembled it over time, um, kind of like cannibalizing the father kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, you know what interested me is he was such a huge figure, but that also a lot of his f most famous first uh, show, mm -hmm. exhibit, if you will, uh, was Joyce Heff, a woman who, as you may know, was uh, claimed to be George Washington's nursemaid. Um, this is 1835, which would have made her 161 years old, um, which he proclaims. There's a handbill for that in the book, which I own. Um, and you know, it says really remarkable things about her. And what I think is interesting is it depicts her as a remarkable thing, being. You know, uh, sometimes people would say, "Oh, she's made of rubber." You know, and then what I think is brilliant about Barnum is he would incorporate any critique or question into the show. Is she made of rubber? Come see. Um, you know, she's an automaton. Oh, is she? You know, is she real? Uh, in different states, um, she, he would do, sort of think about whether she was free or not. Um, this was. She was an enslaved woman. We think so. Yeah, I mean, okay. certainly, we think that Barnum. She certainly had been enslaved, yeah. and we think Barnum purchased her. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's also stories that he might have taken out her teeth to make her look older. Um, you know, it, it's a troubling moment, but at the same time, there was this notion that she was honored, at least in part, by being connected to the father of our nation, and people want to touch him through her. Uh, that has its own problems, but it is a, a different view than I think even later in the century for Barnum himself. So here's Joyce Heff, this figure of uh, perhaps ambivalence, but also of honor. Mm -hmm. And then when she died, Barnum brought her body back to New York and had her, um, excuse me, autopsied in a medical theater uh, for money, uh, charged admission. Uh, with that, he then revealed, of course, that she was of normal advanced age, and then he said, well, you know, we've all been hoaxed, kind of, you know. Um, uh, very, I think, that to me is the most troubling thing, is that he, you know, alive or dead, he owns her, and anything that she does, whether she's a slave or not, is it, owned by him, and any form of the story. And we can kind of see how that plays out now, and that stories, you know, um, get stolen, get borrowed, get taken, the book ends with sort of plagiarism mm -hmm. writ large, but also this way that you know, Barnum, I think, was really brilliant at incorporating the hot button issues of the day because here we are in 1835. Slavery is at the center of life. Uh, there's a question, of course, of George Washington is now becoming a cult. He, in one show, is embodying this American history. And he would go on to do that with his sort of later show called What Is It, which we can talk about. Right. So. If, that, if it had only been about Joyce Heff in terms of his relationship to displaying black people, enslaved mm -hmm. people, as sort of um, you know, a curiosity, and even you know, her autopsy is another sort of like shocking oh, yeah. uh, moment of exploitation in which you know, a thousand people or something, I think you reported, uh, watched her, right? So he's making this tremendous money. But that wasn't the end of his use and exploitation of, of African American people, sure. and it was, they were African American, not, yes. right, but he, for the other people, he said that they were not, right? Oh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, I became really fascinated by sideshow culture and the sideshow as a mm -hmm. facet of American life, mm -hmm. and Barnum, you know, did not invent the sideshow, he mm -hmm. perfected it, and so in the 1830s, he comes to kind of perfect what uh, and I think his genius was to take things that might have been the sideshow and then put them in a museum setting. Mm -hmm. And by museum, you know, there would be an operetta, there would be like a lovely fountain, and then there'd be, you know, like a two-headed uh, monster, you know, mm -hmm. quote unquote. So, you know, he really was able to kind of um, create this this sense of all these things as family entertainment. And we should understand that that it wasn't like you know a specialized thing. A sideshow was the whole family would see what. Um, at the time was seen as kind of wonder. Mm -hmm. um, what these kind of miraculous births of people born different. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, did have a kind of place. Mm -hmm. uh, they were called monsters, but not in the sense that we have now, but monsters as a creation of uh, God's wonder mm -hmm. or prodigies is another name for, mm -hmm. for such births. And um, those people often found lives, careers, money as sideshow entertainers. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't strange for people to have been displayed in this way. Mm -hmm. I think Barnum perfected that and made it, you know, does, which isn't to say the sideshow doesn't have a troubling history. Yeah. But um, we do have to grapple with that and the, our attraction to that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he sort of centralized that. Mm -hmm. But it is true that the stories he then told become really troubling because he would take normal people, quote unquote, and make them exotic mm -hmm. just by being black or brown or whatever or slightly different. Um, he would claim they're from Australia or claim they're from the wilds of deepest Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and the person he did this, I think, th the worst with is a figure named What Is It? So it's capital I-T question mark. Well, and one of the things I stress in the book, and I found this in Harvard's archives, or I had suspected that it was not what is it, but what is it, yeah. um, but in Harvard's archive, and one of the Harvard's librarians is here who helped me, Kate. Um, so, so um, you know, like, the, it was really amazing to find he's on the cover of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, his name's William Johnson. He's on the right okay. here. And he's on the inside. You can see him not, you know, designed. Mm -hmm. um, but what I think is amazing about him is that he was pictured by Barnum in 1860, right after Origin of the Species, as the missing link. Mm. You know, so what is it? You're supposed right. to go in and see and judge for yourself. And this troubling kind of form of democracy that he created, I think, is really telling. And I think he offered up this idea that anyone could be an expert, and you too could decide. Um, for yourself, mm -hmm. is this person human? Is this what is this being? Right. And and in fact, it's not even a being; it's an it. You right. know, and I think that troubling language is a lot of the problem. But uh, I, as I trace in the book, he has a kind of interesting afterlife and and goes on to to interesting things. And one of the figures is sort of in a petting to sue type situation. Well, um, you know, certainly. Uh, uh, Joyce Heth was handled and touched. Yeah. Um, I don't know how close you would get to what is it, actually. Mm. He's usually depicted in, in a kind of caricature mm -hmm. form. I think you were just viewing him mm -hmm. because he was wearing a furry suit. You know yeah. what I mean? It, like, you weren't, I don't think you would get the same, like, uh, what is the, the right term? Like, uh, like, <laughs> no, electric charge from yeah. being cl that close to that person. Because he was, at first he was supposed to be ferocious. Yeah, yeah, he was kind of ferocious, but you'd yeah. go in and have like a stick and just stand in there. Um, and uh, I think the thing that's fascinating to me is um, part of even people reclaiming him and thinking about him in a new way mm -hmm. was talking about him as being microcephalic. And um, mm -hmm. my conviction is that he wasn't even that. Mm -hmm. And at the end of this box I saw at Harvard, there he was smiling at us. And I don't picture that in the book. But, um, and he just looks like a dude with a weird haircut. Yeah. And you realize, like, it's a little like Emmett Till, in all seriousness, where mm -hmm. you know, even in our reclaiming narrative, we kind of assume that Emmett Till, maybe he did something. Right. You know, like we can't just let go and say, you know, maybe those dudes in Starbucks just, I mean, I don't have that, but, you know, there's a dominant narrative. Maybe they did something. Yeah. And maybe he had, there was some reason that Barnum could make him an it. Right. And the truth is that I think he was just a, a performer. Yeah. Uh, and he famously says at the end of his life, well, we fooled them a long time, didn't we? Yeah. Um, and he lived 65 more years after this. So he lived a good long while and he was seen by, something like over 100 million people by the end of his life. Wow. So really a lot of Barnum's reputation and wealth came from this sort of the way he treated race, right, and, and putting oh, it yeah. on display. But we don't really remember any of that. Um, well, we remember quotes that he might not have said, like there's a sucker born every minute. Yeah. Um, my favorite quote, which he did say, is there's a every crowd has a silver lining, which mm. is one of my favorite. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and I think that crowdness is a big part of his appeal and a big part of why we're in this sort of fake news moment. He mm -hmm. appealed to the kind of crowd sensibility. Okay. And he let you as individuals feel like you were making your own discernments, but he really um, played to the crowd in a broad way and that mm -hmm. you 
too could participate and you know it was a little like being at a rally or something you could um, participate and feel like you're making your own individual choice but really he was guiding you to the your decisions and he was shaping your uh, story he would famously at the end of a, uh, his show say this way to the egress mm -hmm. and if you thought it was an, another show there you'd be outside um, so interesting okay so Bunk, the title. Yes. There's an interesting story behind that. Um, Should I hold it? Another thing, sure. Uh, your copy is so nice, mine's <laughs> beat up. It seems bigger than yours. I don't know. Yeah. Revised uh, notes. Oh, okay. uh, so one of the many things I learned was that that term, right, so, much, so many of these hoaxes do have these political underpinnings, right? Yes. Certainly uh, Barnum's work with um, Greeks and with uh, blackness couldn't have existed without the ideologies, the underpinning ideologies sure. that you know fit so well and sort of with the American story. But it was interesting that that even the term bunk originated in sort of political discourse. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it comes from the Missouri Compromise in 1820, and this uh, someone from the House of Representatives floor. Uh, the question's been called. Everything settled, of course, to make mm -hmm. Missouri a slave state, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, this person says, well, I, I need to give one more speech. And they say, look, we're done. You know, yeah. you don't need to. He says, I need to give a speech to Buncombe, mm -hmm. um, being his home county, which is actually where Asheville, North Carolina is. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a beautiful place. Yeah. I can see why he wanted to say that. But that quickly became Buncombe, B-U-N-K-U-M, because it's Buncombe. Uh, and then yeah. it became Bunk. And it just meant political, you know, muckety muck. Yeah. Signaling, frippery nonsense? Um, yeah, like kind of uh, extended BS, you right. know, um, with, but it has a political and racial right. origin. Right. And so it, when it presented itself as a title, which was pretty late uh -huh. in the book, it had another bad title for a long time. Um, Ooh. Yeah. Okay. I won't tell. Um, <laughs> it, it, uh, it really made sense because it's such an American word, bunk. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, I was interested in this as an American phenomenon. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because there were no uh, cameras back then um, in, in that hall, but you know, politicians do that sort of thing. That sounds a very, like a very modern thing to do. Oh, yeah. You can I absolutely mean, imagine people doing for C-SPAN now. Yeah, why would you stop? Right. Um, OK, so uh, one of the things that I thought uh, was really interesting also was that it seems like you're making not just a history, but kind of a typology, there are a lot of different types of falsehood that are yeah. covered in this. But could you talk a little bit about some of the distinctions and the commonalities? And yeah, I was interested in Barnum's definition of humbug, mm -hmm. um, because he really is trying to get us to think about um, humbug not as you know true or something like that, by mm -hmm. no means. He's, he's admitting that he's the prince of humbug, yeah. but a humbug means a good show, like you're being fooled but well, yeah. you know, if the person uh, is a bad fake even, or even like a good fake but not a good show, mm -hmm. that's a bad thing and not humbug. Humbug okay. is the successful hoaxing of someone, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and I try to think about that with Edgar Allan Poe, who mm -hmm. talks about it, in, uh, uh, you know, himself. And so it's a fascinating kind of American notion, like the con man as mm -hmm. getting over. Because I think part of the notion that is, is certainly the con artist um, or, or Poe are trying to think about is getting over is part of the joy. Right. Like he says that, you know, um, it's not complete until the, there's, he calls it diddling. Diddling's not complete until grin at the end. Okay. You know, if you're in bed later and you fooled someone, that's when the grin happens and you're, you know, that's when the act is completed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we still have that and sometimes are drawn, mm -hmm. you know, in say political forums to you know people who promise big and deliver at least entertainment. Mm -hmm. So I think we we experience a kind of mix of feelings when you know Barnum says there's a Fiji mermaid behind this curtain and you go and it's a monkey's head sewn onto a fish's body. You have to walk out and say, well, why did I believe in mermaids? Right. You know, and at least and you're the kind of the jokes on you when you have mm -hmm. to at least sort of participate is part of what he's asking us to do. And again, I go back to this kind of democratic idea. We also have to remember that Barnum's first hoax, 1835, it's a really complicated 
moment where the penny press and technology are starting to change media, uh, the penny press being a penny paper versus a five cent paper. Mm -hmm. And the idea was a lot like the internet, I liken it to, where uh, you know the internet too was supposed to be nearly free and, and promised these great things, but both the penny press and the internet are filled with hoaxes. Yeah. Um, and that technological shift, I think, gets represented by the hoax. Mm -hmm. and, and lastly, I think the hoax too, uh, Barnum's hoax in 1835, it's the exact same moment of blackface being mm. invented. Mm. Um, and this invention of blackface uh, sort of mirrors all these other questions, per pretending to be someone else, mm -hmm. um, uh, transforming what Ralph Ellison calls an exorcism of sort of the white mind and white guilt over slavery into this other form of entertainment. And so you see that those trains are still running. So there's an interesting connection there also when you were talking about the penny press to Barnum again, because uh, I also didn't know that he was a journalist when he started out, but right, he switches. He, he goes into journalism and he is, you know, the same kind of fabulous sure. in that field that he is later, um, but it gets him in trouble. Yeah. So then he switches. Yeah, just make your own paper then. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think that what's interesting too is then he runs for politics uh, mm -hmm. for uh, office later mm -hmm. on. You know, and I think that kind of link between journalism, fakery, and politics is very much with us right now and something right. we're thinking about a lot. Yeah. I could run a circus, <laughs> be a journalist, or run for office. I, I think it's more same like, skills. and yeah, yeah, same, same difference. OK, great. Um, OK, so let's talk a little bit more about journalism, yeah. if that's OK. So I thought that that was sort of one of those interesting uh, parts of this, or it's all interesting. But um, the connection, you know, we talk as though fake news and the concept is something that Obviously, it's an overused term now, but um, as though it's something we just started talking about. But really, the hoax in journalism has been going on a really long time. Um, yeah, I mean, with the Penny Press, that year, 1835, Poe yeah. was publishing hoaxes in papers. Mm -hmm. um, the most famous sort of early hoax, the Moon hoax, mm -hmm. happened in the same press that later would cover the same paper, right. the New York Sun, that would cover Joyce Heth. So it's bound up, I think, into technology. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that we sometimes, uh, especially like with the moon hoax, want to regard earlier generations as somehow being naive. Like, mm -hmm. oh, how'd they believe that? Right. You know, th that there were people on the moon, which is what the moon hoax claimed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's because it was well done as a hoax, first of all. And mm -hmm. second of all, it mirrored back to us what was happening on Earth. It was a way of displacing right. some of our arguments. And the hoax often is. So Actually, um, I thought that that might be a good place to read uh, because sure. it's such an interesting story. Sure. We could. You want me to read about the moon hoax? Yeah. Right here. Let me uh, see. <coughs> I'll uh, just start with this. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Few people remember that in 1835, men first walked on the moon. That year, however, it was all anyone could talk about. The famed reports in the sun described men with bat wings, verspatillo homo, unicorns, and biped beavers as viewed on the moon's surface, leading to much speculation and vast newspaper sales in New York and the rest of the relatively new nation. All the city's papers printed extracts or rebuttals, as with our current headline-worthy hoaxes, anyone remember 2009's Balloon Boy hoax? Every outlet had to weigh in. The news of life on the moon spread like riots had the year before, when mobs of white New Yorkers hit the streets looking for blacks, abolitionists, and amalgamators, the name given to those who they feared were in mm -hmm. favor of race mixing to intimidate, beat up, or worse. Needless to say, none of these discoveries on the moon proved true. Uh, a guy named Locke. Locke's moon hoax would seem not just a parody of science and faith or a prank on a gullible public, but also somehow a transference of some of the energy that led to those riots. Many white readers would rather embrace lunar man bats than their fellow human beings. As detailed in his book on the moon hoax, The Sun and the Moon, Matt Goodman writes that Locke 
helped to make it one, the one make the sun the one paper in the city to come out against slavery in a state that, while it no longer sanctioned slavery, by and large supported in the South and partook of its spoils. I'll jump ahead and read one last part of this. Uh, if so, <coughs> uh, this only supports the question of satire that surrounds the Moonhook. Some people say it was a satire, others mm -hmm. say it was just kind of a lark. Mm -hmm. Though I would insist that intent doesn't make something a hoax or not. Locke's motives seem as complex and unvaried as the canvas of the alleged moon landscape. As an anti-slavery tract, the hoax is too obscure. As racist propaganda, it is not obvious enough, given the extremes that surrounded it. Phrenology and the rest of the racialist sciences then coming into being in the 1830s were mere allegories in the end. Finding one-to-one -one correlations written on the body that determine the subject's intelligence perceived lack thereof. But wait, there weren't just man bats on the moon, but also a superior race of beings there. That they lived on the veil of triads indicated that they were the third highest of the three kinds of upright beings on the moon. It is tempting to see the lunar humanoids as hierarchical in the ways that white eugenicists characterized races on Earth, from biped beavers, metaphoric Native Americans, to woolly man bats, Negroes, to this last group in which, quote, nearly all the individuals in these groups were of larger stature than their former specimens, less dark in color, and in every respect an improved variety of the race. These last are first. They were creatures of order and subordination. Wow. Interesting. So moon hoax. I, I thought the um, War of the Worlds was sort of like the first of its type, but clearly not. No, yeah. No, I, I mean, I think Locke's moon hoax is really fascinating. It's beautiful yeah. to read. Um, and it's kind of constructed, as I talk about, almost like Genesis or something. Mm -hmm. He first sees the sort of firmament, he sees the atmosphere, he sees the, and he starts to go further and further in, and then he sees people by the end, these kind of man bats, uh, and then the superior race of beings. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really brilliantly done, and he also sort of used an actual astronomer, famous mm -hmm. astronomer Herschel, um, who was known to be off in South Africa, uh, viewing the moon from there, from the Cape of Good Hope. So he kind of you knew enough about the science to make it seem scientific, and then many people say that he helped invent science fiction ah. doing so. That, sound, that sounds about right. <laughs> sounds about right. Great. Um, okay, so I'm getting a little bit obsessed with the journalistic yes, yes. side of things, but I do have one. Well, we one. can talk about it because I think it's yeah. really important in this moment. Yeah. Like you said, fake news is, yeah. is sort of this, this weird wor word. Mm -hmm. And what I love about Seth's book, Hard News, which is uh -huh. a really great book, you should get it if you don't have it, is about you know Jason Blair, uh, one of many yeah. hoaxers of the past 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Gosh, it's longer than that almost. Is it? I mean, he was 2003, four, four yeah. Okay. Um, but Stephen Glass was 96, 90, mid 90s. So mm -hmm. um, that kind of level of fakery, I think, in some of the highest, most regarded papers is really troubling. And mm -hmm. I, I think that all of them involve race in some weird way. I think mm -hmm. Stephen Glass uh, and his hoaxing at the New Republic, um, you know, pretended race was all, and C Jason Blair did in a different way too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. So I'm thinking of the connection between, uh, um, oddly enough, uh, some of the types of fake news, is, fake news that has been used politically of late uh, and spread through social media and fake news pamphlet that was distributed during the, the um, re-election campaign, uh, Abraham Lincoln's re-election campaign right. in 1864. Um, so can you tell us that story a little bit? Yeah, um, it's called, the pamphlet's called Miscegenation. Mm -hmm. um, and it, that's where that term des derives from, which is, uh, I think, you know, for race mixing. Uh -huh. And it's funny for me now, knowing that when people use it unironically, like anti-miscegenation laws. Yeah. Well, those existed before mm -hmm. this pamphlet that claimed to be for miscegenation. Mm -hmm. And Barnum himself in his Humbugs of the World talks about that as a brilliant hoax because mm -hmm. who would have been in favor of that? Or mm -hmm. who would have thought Negroes were equal, which is part mm -hmm. of the, the pitch of the, mm -hmm. the absurdity of this yeah. pamphlet. Um, and its political stamp, I think, is very 
familiar to sort of some of what the Russian bots, for right. instance, did in the last election, which is claim an extreme, uh, in quotations, p position, right. ascribe it to your enemy, and then try to sit back and, and watch right. what happens. Right. Uh, it didn't change the election in the case of miscegenation in 1864, but it seems to have certainly had a big effect on our elections. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of the weaponizing of one's worst fears right. uh, or the worst fears of the other turned against the other person, um, I think, is chillingly familiar. Yeah. So I love that story because I'm writing about the politics of interracial um, relationships yeah. and the idea that this pamphlet um, was sent out to abolitionists so that um, asking them, so what do you think about this idea that right, it's right. a great I, great thing for race, races for black and white to mix, yeah. right? So that they could write back and say, oh yeah, that's a great idea. And, and then, then sure. he could say, uh, see, that's what they really want. Right, um, which he didn't really want, I mean. Which he didn't really want, well, right? Well, the abolitionists so he was, were like. He was anti-abolitionist. Yeah. 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 And the abolitionists even weren't really like, they were sort of like, oh, Yeah, they're okay. like, slavery's bad, but I don't know about how good but black people But I don't know about are. how good that mixing thing is. <laughs> or just um, black people, period. Right. But in terms of poking the bear, I mean, it truly has everything that we're talking about now, sure. including um, trying to stir up, <laughs> make the most of conflicts that are already there, oh, yeah. like with the Irish, right? It specifically singles out the Irish yeah. as... Uh, who had had you know the draft riots about the Civil War, not wanting to um, serve, and you know had all this resentment against blacks and, and racism, and says that they Irish would be improved by yeah right. I mean it is I don't know the word shitster sort of uh, I don't know if I should say that on well, there's mostly being paid, adults right? here. Um, I mean yeah 2016 is we've got nothing on that sort of. No, no. I mean, the scary thing is is one of the myths that I, I started to feel really troubled by is our myth of progress, mm. which I realize that I still, even though I feel like I've worked on some of the other myths and got rid of them, we still have this notion that things are getting better, better and different. Right. And my thinking about the hoax realized that, you know, from sort of the 1860s where you see what is it, um, there's another hoax that Barnum started called the Sarcassian Beauty, which is a fascinating yeah. other one. We don't have time, I think, to mm -hmm. go into. Um, all the way, to, I think, to the 20s, you see this kind of mix of things, as it were. Um, and then by sort of the 1920s, I really think the hoax becomes a figure of horror. Yeah. And it used to be kind of honorific, even what is it. He's trying to kind of uh, at least have him be not magisterial, I think it's pretty bad. But the progress notion, you know, across even Barnum and across uh, the century and a mm -hmm. half um, really goes worse, in my opinion. Mm. Um, and the hoax now is not only there's more and more intense hoaxes, they also are about worse and worse things. Right. So it can't, it's not enough to say, um, you know, they're going to marry your daughters or something. It's also like, you know, Pizzagate. Like the like Their the travels. worst yeah. horrible horrors, but the hoax always, as I realize, plays on our deepest divisions, and that's one of its uh, engines. It's one of its points. It's one of the things that lets it be believed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I started out the book thinking about why we deceive each other, but really ended up thinking about why we believe these things, uh, and why we believe the worst fears about the other person. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the hoax really gets in there and, and messes with that. So yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about how Birth of a Nation is the kind of film that is all about a hoax, like a hoax, hoax is history, right? Yes. Um, but and people know it's the, about the founding of the Klan as a kind of mythic American. Heroic. Yeah, by D.W. Griffith. Yeah. I, I used to teach film, and I watched that film like three times. The whole, you know, there's like a shortened version. I watched like the whole three hours. Yeah. And then the third time, I, I, my brain imploded, and I, I, I wrote this instead. I mean, you know, I, I think that they do take a lot of, I mean, it's a, a question I have, like, is cinema or are reality shows, like, taking from hoaxes, or are they just mirror hoaxes? Mm. Um, you know, they're not hoaxes in the true sense. Um, it's a spectacle, but it really mirrors history and really sort of is almost like a forgery. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what 
it's hard for us to reckon with is our entertainment value that I think Barnum nailed, mm -hmm. that we want to see some of these questions worked out. Um, and it is a bit like the more uh, typical definition of a monster, the hoax is. It's a thing that we've created that we then want to kill in front of us to sort of purge, but often they aren't killed. They often just live on and on, uh, like Jason and like Friday the 13th 8 or something, you know. Um, OK, so I want to uh, talk sort of really fast forward and Please. talk about why you do think. Um, it seems that you do think that things have actually gotten worse, right? Not just that there's no, you know, there isn't progress. Um, but why and, and how so? Well, do people think it's gotten worse lately? <laughs> but knowing the history, not not knowing the history. Okay. Why do you think it's worse? Uh, why? Because uh, I'm used to just the, you know. Yeah, it feels worse, yeah. right? Um, but, well, I think that there's many reasons. The reason I sort of stumbled across the best explanation is a kind of narrative crisis that we've been in, what I end up calling the age of euphemism. And I think that right now, there was this, a lot of the stories that bound us as a nation um, came into question, whether it was the presidency and Watergate or uh, the truth with Vietnam or the civil rights movement and our notion of being one nation under God, however you want to think of it. Um, those kind of things were being pulled apart and the hoax kind of steps in in that instance. In, in the absence of one story, a fake one, a, a somewhat good one will do. And not even a terribly good one, just any story. And I think you see that in recent uh, politics. I think you see that um, across the board in different ways. And I, I think it feeds the hoax, uh, this narrative crisis we've had. Um, and anyone who stands up and says, well, this is, I'm going to give you a direction. Mm -hmm. And this is the direction we're going in. Mm -hmm. And things are, you know, because things are terrible, but I can make them better, is a better story right. in a way than things are OK. You know, it's, it plays on the hoax, the hoax atmosphere. Um, it's harder to believe everything's better, or that person over there is a person. Okay. It's easier to say that person is an it. Um, and we've been in that cycle, I think, for a while. Now, the only hope I have is that hoaxes get worse in certain times, and they do get better, mm. I think. Um, but I think they require us um, not being cynical, ironically. I mean, I think at first I thought, if we were cynical enough, we'll get past it. Okay. But the idea that everything is fake, you know, which I think is the ultimate cynical position, which I think is very dominant now, mm -hmm. actually makes you more susceptible to hoaxes. Uh, it makes you okay. believe something right. because you're like, nothing's true. And you're like, right. well, this seems true to me. Right. And it confirms my fears. Right. Um, as opposed to a kind of journalistic skepticism that I think is really useful. We have this kind of American cynicism. Um, what Mary Carr, the writer, says, the American religion now is doubt. Because mm. you don't want to be a sucker. You want to be like, I doubt you. Right. I want to doubt before you doubt me. Um, but if, there, if no one has authority, the scientists don't have authority, and the well, yeah. journalists don't have authority. Then what? Then what? You can tell anybody anything, right? I made a. I tried to make a list, um, bringing it forward because I saw so many commonalities between 2016 election and uh, and President Trump and some of the sort of hoaxes that have been part of his story along the way, right? From birtherism, but that's not really right. That's not really the first one. From uh, in terms of being a showman, the the one that I thought is kind of the funniest is him being his own publicist. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. I wish I'd written more about that. Mm -hmm. uh, Baron or something? Yeah, that... Baron, which he then named his son. Yeah, someone just Baron. made that connection for me. I was like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, I mean, or, you don't have to say anything about that. It writes itself. Right. Or uh, saying when he first wanted to be on the Forbes list that he was worth hundreds of millions, and apparently he was worth five, yeah. possibly, at the time. Um, well, but I mean, that's, I mean, you know, I, I think that there's a very American notion in that. You know, we value success, but we, more than success, we value the appearance of success. Mm -hmm. And um, it's why, you know, like, there's, there's something almost admirable in, in the most pure, if we can stand back and, you know, it's like why rappers show money in videos, mm -hmm. you know, like, 
it's not because they have money necessarily, like the cars are rented, um, but it's like here I have money, and then you make money because people think you have money. Mm. Um, it's kind of this al alchemy of, and you know, even a painter like Jean-Michel Basquiat, who I think was really brilliant about such things, he started drawing money on his paintings, and he said, like, and then I started making all this money after mm. that. And it's this kind of alchemy that they're trying for, I think. Right. It's very almost American. Certainly, it's African American in its improvisational qualities mm -hmm. uh, for Basquiat. I mean, I think he um, is trying to say, fake it till you make it. Right. Which rap, rap I mean, yeah. right? It's always doing like, that's why you put that in your video, and then eventually, hopefully, you have that. <laughs> I mean, right? the next video you might, might be your money. Right. Um, so we should do that right now. Let's, <laughs> let's pull out our wads. Uh, yeah. Big bank take little bank. It's interesting also how um, just sort of switching to the positive component or at least the positive functions that hoaxes can serve. Um, so sort of the myth, and I, I think of it as sort of a hoax of right. American exceptionalism mm. is really interesting because that coexists, the idea that America is this land of equality and absolute freedom. Sure. Um, and it's being founded on that at the same time it's completely dependent on slavery, right? Which is the ultimate um, taking away of freedom. But that myth allows us to feel good about American identity, right? Um, but even more, that's sort of like not quite a positive. So uh, <laughs> switching to more of a positive. Yeah, how sad. Uh, uh, we heroize some of the most successful con men. Apart uh, absolutely. From, apart from President Trump. So are there, um, I was thinking about popular culture. Sure and uh, how we love, like when we see them in the movies or in television, sure. right? We love some I mean, of the stories. I, I wanted to write even more about Gatsby, who I mm -hmm. think is, mm -hmm. is a perfect exemplar yeah. in a fictional sense of yeah. this kind of American <coughs> art of reinvention, which I do think plays into our notions of mm -hmm. hoaxing um, and why we Absolutely. sort of uh, can tolerate some level of it yeah. or are entertained by it. And I think Gatsby's a brilliant, uh, fable about that because yeah. he reinvents himself as Gatsby. Right. Um, you know, uh, what's he say, sport, he calls everyone good sport. Mm -hmm. And um, this idea of him sort of adopting that is still yet not enough. Mm -hmm. You know, he, and uh, it's a fascinating film that I think, you know, we were talking just before about Mad Men. Right. You know, that to me is the other sort of modern version where you take a dead man's identity and you're always faking, mm -hmm. but maybe in that you become yourself, you know. Um, and he does, right? So in Mad Men, yeah, he, he is, is he a hero or an anti-hero? <sighs> wow. Is the so you're trying to make me write another book about this, aren't you? Okay. I mean, you know, I think he, I, I think that um, he's a kind of American anti-hero. I think, mm -hmm. sure. I mean, he. Is it, can we give spoilers? I mean, how many years has it been? It's um, been a while. <laughs> we're safe. I'm sure that people haven't watched it here. But um, you know, I think that his sort of arc into American iconography, mm -hmm. um, the VW Bug, mm -hmm. the Coca-Cola, right. all the you know tobacco. I mean, the tobacco. And the tobacco thing is is almost more emblematic of this literally American product mm -hmm. that, uh, that is native to us and that then is being sold as this, uh, you know, cure-all, mm -hmm. and even though they know it's not. And right. that, that kind of is, a, is a perhaps even more deadly metaphor than in Gatsby right. for what fakery can do and, and eat at you. So, you know, we have this beautiful, heroic, character, sort of heroic, sort of anti-heroic, deceptive character. And the Lucky Strike um, account, where they're trying to sell tobacco as being um, healthy. Sure. This, I mean, this, this one's is, toasted, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's toasted. So, you know, clearly I mean, it's there's, healthy. you know, there's much like that. I mean, we have these contradictions. Mm -hmm. And what I was, what was interesting to me is the way that the hoax uh, because it's fake, tells us the truth. Mm. Because once it's gone away and revealed, we are only left with our belief. Mm -hmm. So we have to kind of reckon with that. And I thought that especially with, say, Stephen Glass. Mm. Um, I mean, there are other people who I think this is examples of, but his hoaxes were so pinned to race. Yeah. 
why did we believe them, or did certain people believe them? Mm -hmm. Why James Fry was he believed um, as this figure when he you know, faked his first memoir, and then his second memoir, which is called My Friend Leonard. Has anyone read My Friend Leonard? My Friend, yeah, you did. Um, what's crazy is, so the first book, of course, he lied about being in prison when mm -hmm. he was in jail for like a couple hours. But the beginning of My Friend Leonard is in prison like month three. Yeah. So the, the whole of My Friend Leonard is just a total fabrication. Mm -hmm. And the beginning of it is him getting in a fight with a big black guy named Porterhouse. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, so this is all from his imagination, of course. Right. And then he teaches Porterhouse how to read, because of course Porterhouse mm -hmm. can't read right. as big black guys in jail that you make up. Mm -hmm. uh, can't. Um, and can anyone tell me the guess, and if you know, don't say, what book that he uses to teach Porterhouse how to read? Right. Correct. Mm. Huck Finn. What's funny is I think it's about 75% that people guess yeah. correctly. I mean, the only other option is Uncle Tom's Cabin, but that would have been well, yeah. two on the nose. Two on the nose. Yeah. yeah, so he had to move it up a few, few decades right. or, or a week. Um, but you know, that kind of, I think I call him a, you know, a kind of abolitionist on safari kind of thing. Yeah. Um, oh. And I think that that quality. White savior, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. of course. And so once that's revealed, you know, we're stuck with just his belief or our belief or his invention that, you know, why did that pass for true? Mm -hmm. um, and so in that reckoning, I think we have to think a lot about these kind of deep American stories. Right. A lot of what passes for true passes for true because it's, or we want it to be true either because it's self-aggrandizing to the person and they're attractive or it's self-aggrandizing to us, right, to the American identity or to the but what audiences is, but, but this idea to. of this prisoner, mm -hmm. who's that self-aggrandizing? I guess it's to, to fry, fray, yeah. right, because he's the hero. But I also think it's because it's, it's super tragic and messed up. Mm. You know, it, it speaks to our need for what I start the book with, um, all the American public wants is a tragedy with a happy ending. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and that idea of the tragic, but then at the very end, right. you know, is I think much more um, what it's about. So it isn't simply that it's aggrandizing, mm -hmm. excuse me, it's exotic, it's okay. questionable, it's troubling, right. but then at the end, you get a little bit of reading mm -hmm. uh, is fundamental. So there's one person that um, is in this book that. I have an aversion to talking about, but I would love to hear oh, no. you talk about. Can you guess? I can guess what I want you to say. <laughs> Actually, I wrote down her name because, um, uh, what you is her? You want to make us wait? Nikichi, uh, the new name, Rachel Dolezal? Rachel Dolezal, she has another she has name? An, yes, she has a new name uh, now. You know, um, I finished my essay and luckily didn't have to read about her anymore. Oh, I. I so tell them about it, but I'll, I'll oh, give yeah. you the name because the name is such, again, um, stealing identity. It's Nicki Minaj or something? What's her no, name? No, I'll tell you in a second. It's African sounding. African sounding. That's awesome. Yes. Um, it well, as you remember, Rachel Dolezal was the Nikichi white. Nikichi Amari Diallo. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That is the current name that she I mean, using. I couldn't make that up. That's you too good. I couldn't make that up. Huck Finn would be proud. Um, I guess what uh, she almost troubles me most, you yeah. know, because she uh, is a white woman who, of course, darkened her skin, changed her hair, and claimed to be black, mm -hmm. then was the head of the NAACP in Oregon. I mean, mm -hmm. she couldn't have done that in Harlem, where the Schomburg Center is. That one worked, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that she, like, picked her place to do this. And I wonder if it's a little like um, when Gene Wilder's in blackface in, mm -hmm. um, what's that movie? Um, Silver Streak. Yeah, and everyone, all the black people know, but right, you know. Right. Um, I wonder about that, like what mm -hmm. was happening with that. But my real trouble with her is, of course, she got much more attention for being not black right. than black people often get. She was on the Today Show a whole bunch of times. And then a week later was the Charleston murders. Yeah. And it kind of pushed her off the whatever front page or first, second half hour of Today Show. Mm -hmm. Um, but I started thinking that, and I end up writing about this, that they, the killer and her both 
had the similar kinds of misunderstandings of blackness. Mm. And that they both um, thought of blackness as this tragic thing because mm -hmm. Rachel Dolezal yeah. was attracted to the horror, you know, the right. blackness as being like, uh, you know, tragic. Right. And um, his, and I, I redact his name in the book on purpose, yes. his point of view couldn't be swayed by these very much people praying in front of him and praying with him. Right. He couldn't then change his input, you know? And I feel like she too misunderstood blackness as tragic. And the difference is she wanted to be that, he wanted to murder that, yeah. um, but both have this similar uh, problem with it. Um, and I really wanted to think about aloud about this problem with race, um, this wish to be someone else. And when it occurs in the book, it occurs more like toward the plagiarism chapter, because there's a kind of plagiarizing of another person's pain that yeah. you see over and over again in the 20th century, whether it's fake Native Americans, which someone called pretendians, which mm -hmm. I think is a great uh, term, or you know, like fake black folks or blackface. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have two poles in blackface, it's tragic or comic, and ultimately they're the same thing. There's mm -hmm. no tragedy that isn't ridiculous and no comedy that isn't a little bit sad, really. Uh, Mammy being the song uh, from the jazz singer being sort of the ultimate uh, example of that. As opposed to, say, the blues or actual African-American inventions, which know that within, uh, that you're laughing to keep from crying. And, and they aren't maudlin. They're, in fact, f deeply funny. You know, you've been a good old wagon, but you done broke down is a philosophy, mm -hmm. you know? It's a way of thinking about the world and it provides a kind of answer and a way to name pain to move past it. And that's so different than plagiarizing pain and living in it and, and trying to make it your uh, existence. Um, one is a form of resistance and one is a form of, I don't know what. So there, you mentioned the nice lady who uh, in every church, like there's one like, Nice white lady. Nice white lady who shows up. In every black church, yeah. Right, but she never tries to claim blackness, yeah. right? In, in my, the, yeah, in and, my church at least there was But Rachel lady wants to show up and not just claim it. Yeah, she, she wants, wants to be the to. center of she it. She wants to be the center of it, and that... And me, the question I have is why do you, if you feel black, which she says, yeah. why do you have to look black? Right. Also, you know, in the, in the telling, I'm really interested in the telling of her story because... Um, one of the things that you talk about that a lot of people don't when they talk about Rachel Dolezal is the fact that she makes up so much backstory. She's yeah. not content to just say, okay, I want to look black. I want people to believe that I'm black and I want to be able to tell, um, you know, to have authority. But she makes up an entire tragic backstory for herself. Um, so her level of deception is so deep and that, that stole, it's literally stolen pain. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the difference. I mean, sometimes people ask me what's, the definition of the hoax, you know, I think there's a number of them I give in the book, but one that I, I sort of think of, return to is it's lying with explanations, mm. you know, that it keeps going on and on. Mm -hmm. um, so this, it, the more I read and the more I saw, that's not surprising, you know, she, people often have to invent not just their tragic backstory, but like others around them, mm -hmm. a whole host of people, someone like JT Leroy who pretended to be a man pretending to be a woman, um, you know, there's a whole, you know, it was only tragic. And I, again, I return to this American notion. Um, would we have, would she have gone as far if she said, you know, I was a black person? Mm -hmm. You know, like that, right. that wouldn't have been as, uh, yeah. you know, selling uh, for her. She complains about colorism and being beaten. Oh, and, Lord. Uh, it's like she's telling I the mean, color purple, but it's. The know, color what? The color what? Question. I, I personally love all the names that came up. I thought she was going to be a joke on Black Twitter, which I talk about. Mm -hmm. And we came up with all these great names for the inevitable biography, autobiography. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't remember who said their eyes were watching Oprah was one oh, of yeah. them. <laughs> I think you made up a few, too. I, Blackish Like Me was one of mine. Blackish Like Me. I think I, did I do the Oprah one? I might have done Oprah. And then um, I think Victor Laval said an imita the imitation of imitation of life or something like that. So that's kind of a, I felt like that maybe that was a little bit more of a personal story because the voice seemed different um, yeah. in terms of the writing style. Yeah, it was a, um, toward the end. And as I say in the book, I thought I was done. You know, mm -hmm. I sort of cataloged these hoaxes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, then I got asked 
uh, for a book by Jesmyn Ward, uh, The Fire This Time, to write an essay. And I wrote on Dolezal. Mm -hmm. And partially, I was writing out of fury that I had to keep thinking about this. Mm -hmm. you know, and partially what happened for me is I realized and told my editors, I said, look, I can't, I got to stop because there's going to be another hoax next week if I keep going. Yeah. And sort of once all the stuff with fake news happened, I literally just would like add a sentence because right. so much of it I had already sort of, uh, if not predicted, then sort of uh, prophesized or so yeah. somehow thought of uh, in some way. And so Dolezal was like one extra thing, almost a a straw too many, but yeah. I, I then, and then my editor kept saying, you need to put it in the book, or yeah. should you? And I was like, he was very gentle, which yeah. was smart. Um, okay. But I was like, I don't think so, I don't think so. And then I was like, oh, I have to, because she really, and she really helped end the book and tell this kind of story that goes on and on and let me be a bit more personal. And um, I mean, I think at one point I say, I, I could read from that part, and then I, we could actually, turn to questions great. from mm -hmm. you guys. I'll just read a little from that essay. It kind of jumps around on purpose. <clears throat> it's called Blacker Than Thou. It was never easy for me. I was born a poor black child. The beginning of Steve Martin's The Jerk still makes me laugh with its twist on Once Upon a Time. The dissonance between what we know of the white comedian Martin, his relative success, and his obviously false declaration sends up not only the tragic showbiz biography, but the corny black one. In both, the worser, the better. It also suggests his character's transformation, his overcoming, after all, he's clearly white now. Not to mention his current lot in which he's, a sm which he's smudged, bummy, apparently destitute. His isn't blackface, but his face half greased is certainly part of the effect. Excuse me. It's a familiar one, in other words, to black people used to watching white people only claim blackness as a poor me stance. Now, why does this jerk remind me of Rachel Dolezal? Here's the thing I'm talking about. When Rachel Dolezal's fraud first broke, it was simply a joke on black Twitter, which, as you probably know, isn't a separate app. But um, I identified some of my favorite Twitter titles from the inevitable anticipated memoir. Their eyes were watching Oprah. That one's mine. Imitation of Imitation Life from Victor Laval, Blackish Like Me, mine too. Now things done got serious. There's a long tradition of passing, of crossing the racial line, usually going from black to white. You could say it was started like this country by Thomas Jefferson. One of the best things about being black is that barring some key exceptions, it's not a volunteer position. You can't just wish on a dark star and become black. It's not paid either. It's more like a long internship with a chance of advancement. <clears throat> After the killings in Charleston, several things happened. Dolezal's story went back to being merely ridiculous. Talk shows moved on to something else, and those who somehow willed Dolezal sublime retreated. Flags flew at half staff, except the Confederate flag on South Carolina State House grounds. It took a black woman, Brittany Newsom, to climb up and take that down. They gave the assignment to a black man to raise the rebel flag back up. Like Sally Hemings, he might not have minded, but he certainly couldn't have refused. Thank you. So. Okay. I guess that's a good place to. Uh, Sally Hemings. End. Yeah. <laughs> Rachel, I mean, can I ask you one last Yes, thing? you can ask me. Did it ever uh, feel here. as though history was just making this stuff up for you? I mean, it's sort of like the world was um, sort of conspiring to make this this particular moment for this book to come out. I mean, election of 20, Rachel Dulles, all 2015, the election in 2016. Yeah. I mean, I'm really glad that I, I had said before then that I would stop. You know, in the mm -hmm. summer of 16, I said, you know, I, I got to finish this book because there's going to be another hoax next week. And right. um, the election was on my birthday. So I had to go ah. away and like write this coda. Um, but it, it was kind of more a horrible thing to be right about. You know, and I say that in the coda, like I, I hated, I realized. You know, then that I wanted kind of a tragic story with a happy ending. I mm -hmm. wanted 
-hmm. this to, to end in a kind of, well, things are looking up, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, CNN had a year of the hoax. It had, you know, declared all these things about hoaxes a few years in a row, and then they just gave up. You know, the Washington Post had a hoax tracker. They just gave up, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it just got really dark there for a while, as it were. And, mm -hmm. um, I feel a little more hopeful now than I think I do in the end of the book, mm -hmm. but uh, I think that's more because I think people are starting to talk about mm -hmm. this problem, and I hope my book helps that. Okay. So now you guys have to do some work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much. Um, so Kevin, I have, I have a question for you. As someone who writes nonfiction, writes poetry, um, do you have a separate process for doing that, and how do, or does working in one genre influence and interact with, with the other? Uh, yeah, thanks, Seth. Um, I'd say yes, it does. It's not so direct or obvious to me how. Um, definitely, nonfiction requires a different kind of attention. Um, poems, though I think poems are intense and can do, they generally you can think about in a session or look through a manuscript. Um, in a book like this, you have to just, it's every day plugging away. And um, you know, I revised it quite a bit over the years and I have to turn this giant chip around like you know, two times a year. It took a lot out of me. Um, but you have to be sort of there physically for it, um, even with computers and all that. And what was interesting is it requires a lot more reading um, the same amount of introspection, mm -hmm. but I really, especially for a book about hoaxes, I want there to be you know, notes and a bibliography. And believe me, there were books I read about hoaxes that had no notes, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I was like, this feels like a hoax itself. Right. Like, it's <laughs> right. so weird. Yeah. Exactly. And um, you know, I admire you as a journalist uh, making that really clear. Here's who I talk to. Here's right. what I listen to. Right. Here's what this is from. And that's, you know, it's not just, I think people sometimes dismiss that as sort of intellectualism, when really it's the trail that someone hooks into footnote number 50 and wants to find out more, you're, you're laying out you know, how you got there. Um, and I you know, am super, you know, my process, not like a sharer of it. Like I, I'm reading these totally disparate things that don't seem to make sense together, even sometimes to me. But once I follow my nose, there they are, and I want you to be able to too, and maybe you'll come to a very different conclusion. Um, that said, I think both Bunk and my new book, Brown, which is just out, um, is a book that, of poems, but it, they're both interested in history and the way history touches uh, us all and, and that we're part of history, whether we admit it or not. And, and that kind of connection, I think I almost felt, maybe because of Bunk, I felt more comfortable with in Brown, but at one point there was sort of the public poems in Brown, the poems about athletes or Arthur Ashe or, uh, you know, uh, Lead Belly, and then there were sort of poems about me and my love of music or my love of sports um, and my growing up in Kansas in part uh, and living in the South when I was writing it. Um, so my goal by the end was to make those things together. And I think that Bunk sort of helped me understand how to tell a history in a certain way, and to not keep those strands so separate. Yeah. So, um, so um, there's some obvious parallels, you know, going back in history, as, as you, you noted. And I'm just wondering what you might think is different. Is there is there anything about um, the way things unfold now, the way we communicate, the technology we have? Is there anything about um, the way that these hoaxes are per perpetuated now that is different, and is that in some ways more or less hopeful? You know, in terms yeah. of like moving forward. Uh, did you say hopeful at the end? Mm -hmm. I, I did. So I was. I, I gave you an opportunity yeah. Yeah. For, for hope there. You don't have to take it. Well, uh, the two things I think is that hoaxes can be propagated faster um, just with a click, and suddenly, you know, it's a simple thing made by a guy in a basement or, say, uh, uh, for nefarious reasons in Russia. Um, <laughs> and then suddenly it's targeted to specific people 
as opposed to everyone. And I think that is really troubling, and I don't think we've quite reckoned with that. I sort of was starting to say in my book, you know, here's what technology could do and its problems. I wouldn't have thought that the hoax could be kind of weaponized um, in a way that it clearly was. So, uh, and it's clear and clear every day. But what interests me is that that targeted exactly these same divisions. I also think it sometimes can be, you know, I, I try to say in the book that journalists catch journalistic hoaxes, the internet catch, catches internet hoaxes. You know, it's not simply that the internet is a vast place of conspiracies and dead ends, though sometimes it feels that way. Um, so that is important, and I do think that uh, at the same time, you know, it's really harder now for a hoax to go away completely sometimes. Um, and I think you've seen people now start to try to, let's say in journalism, include like birtherism. It, you know, the claim sometimes gets reported as if it's a claim without saying that it's a false claim. And I think you see people now much more saying this false claim uh, is, was repeated, you know. Um, but it can be, I think, harder to, to dissuade people who don't want to be dissuaded. I was um, on a talk radio thing, and a guy called in, and he, well, two guys called in. One called in, and he said he had started a poetry um, uh, prize, and there was, it was sort of like the March Madness. There were brackets, and people got really excited and invested in who won, and then he declared a winner, and then he also admitted that he had written all the poems that were in the bracket. Yeah. Um, and I was like, uh, what? You know, like, that, yeah. was, that was pretty wild, you know? And I'm like, you, you got some explaining to do. You know, right. no wonder people are upset at you. But then someone else called, and they said, it might have been a separate program, but um, they said, oh, well, the reason that there's so many more hoaxes is because Obama passed that law. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's like the law where you can just hoax people now, and that's, <laughs> that's legal. I mean, we laugh about it, but this person didn't yeah. just think like it, you know, was completely serious, and um, you know, in a weird way, was uh, was not in a hoax in the sense that they were being hoaxed, but they were not operating in that realm. They hadn't been sort of de-hoaxed yet, and that was really interesting. Um, and then the commentator was like, "What do you think of this right. law?" You know, um, <laughs> but said, you know, really? like, what is the name of that law? Yeah, there's a law. Uh -huh. You know, you have yeah. to be able, but the, our capacity to say. Oh, here's the name of the law. It goes back to sources. If we, we don't have a good sense of sources and a good sense of what is a good source, um, and a lot of things can seem the same online. Um, and I think that, you know, physics, I mean, civics class helps, mm -hmm. and I feel like we lost that. And libraries, I think, are these great places where you get neutral information and provide, you know, I work in one, so I think that you can find anything there. Uh, and I, actually a lot more than the internet. Thanks for your question. Hello. Hey. Um, so I, I'm interested in the whole, the 1830s and the sort of, this, yeah. is it that you, cause you say at one point you said democracy and you just sort of, and as a yeah. thing that was part of this. And um, you know, of course that's like right after Andrew Jackson's elected sure. in this crazy populist election where it's the first guy who wasn't some serious guy. He's a guy who waves his pistol around. Mm -hmm. What? So what was it about that? Like the, the idea of the connection between populism and democracy and how that lends itself to hoaxes. And yeah, this loss of we don't have the king anymore, but then that means we don't have authority figures anymore who tell us things. So yeah. what, talk, talk a little I mean, bit about. I mean, I think that, you know there were hoaxes when kings were around, of course. Um, but the hoax would usually be like, that person's a prince, you know? Uh, <laughs> right. I'm a lost prince, right. you know? Um, I'm the lost Irina, you know, that was very common. But obviously in the States, you don't see that as much. Um, I was really interested in the ways that that played out almost with, and you see it even now, with a kind of claim toward nativeness, um, both like I belong here, but also kind of often literal, I am native, you know, by especially white folks saying that they were. Um, and that really interested me as a kind of tactic going back to the Boston Tea Party, you know, and, and what it meant to put on this mask, an American mask. Um, and how did that play out over time? Um, I do think that populism, I find, inexact term. Um, this is just me personally. I mean, populism gets used uh, to refer to a kind of elite bashing 
but by elites, so you know, by people who are you know richer than God, and so it becomes a kind of strange term. Um, you know, growing up in Kansas, there was a kind of different notion of populism. I feel like a kind of farmer-based, like you have your opinion, I have mine. Let's you know make good fences, good neighbors, kind of thing. Um, so I don't know. I, I feel not totally settled on how populism plays into, except for there's this idea of the mob versus the crowd versus the populace that you see play out in the 1830s a lot in around riots, around um, the penny press itself. Uh, and I don't know how that is with us now. Certainly, we're being in it and being a fish in the water, <laughs> not knowing how wet we are, it's hard to talk about. But I can't imagine that we won't look back and think about uh, Black Lives Matter and that movement on one hand, and then its seeming opposite on the other, and how that the hoax kind of knitted those things together or tried to make sense of it. Um, but I don't have a good total response for you. That's all right. It's a big question. <laughs> it is a big question. Everyone's trying to make me write third book about this yeah. stuff. I like it. Hi, thanks. Um, I have two that I think are related. Is there a history of fact checking and sort of calls for corrections? And then current day, um, just given the technology that you sort of talked about, I'm thinking about the tipping point when we all recognize something as a hoax. Yeah. And does it take an authority figure, usually white, to say that? Or is it Snopes.com and we all sort of move on? Like, what's. Yeah. Are you saying now or in general? I, I, I think. Yeah, it just seems like, oh, of course that was a hoax, but who decided, like, how do we come to that? Well, it's a little we... like, I guess what I would say, it's always a hoax. And the question is, when is it recognized? I mean, wh why now are there, like, more flat earthers than there were? Well, and I always ask, like, why is that happening now? Not just, like, because um, I think the world was, is round. Um, <laughs> And you know, Kyrie Irving is like, I'm a flat earther, yo. But, you know? but he did that, that to manipulate defiance? the media. Like he, he was making a point. I yeah, think. isn't part I of guess. that defiance though? But that's so crappy. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, you know, Kanye West all over my timeline, and then oh. like, whoops, you know. Well, I, that's I, a different I, thing. I don't know what. I don't, um, what that I don't know. I have a hard time with. If you hoax and then pull the shade away, are you still not a hoaxer? You know, I think you actually are a hoaxer. That's the definition of a hoaxer. Um, so I have a hard time sort of letting people off the hook, especially about what they hoaxed about. Yeah. You know, and, and admitting you hoax doesn't get you out of that. Um, and that's what I was trying to draw attention to with these hoaxes about race. Mm -hmm. And then the larger kind of question is, of course, that uh, race itself is a kind of hoax, mm -hmm. uh, which is to say a fake thing pretending to be true. Mm -hmm. um, this doesn't mean racism is fake, um, quite the opposite. And I think it's almost, it's intractability comes from that it isn't from this real thing. So uh, the first part of your question, I actually don't know the answer to. Um, it's a great idea. I do think that I became really interested in objectivity in journalism, uh, which I do, I don't know if that helps or hurts us um, as to debunk these things because, uh, yeah, it's a fairly recent phenomenon, um, objectivity, and other journal ideas of journalist, journalism don't have it exactly. It's a kind of American notion, right? Um, as opposed to, say, accuracy, uh, which I think should be the point of all journalism. But it isn't objective to present like two sides of climate change debate. But you see that happen regularly on shows, especially makes good TV, you know? Or back when Oprah would like entertain the Klan right. for like an hour, you know, I, I think that there's this kind of weird mix between accurate attention and then also ignoring the total crap. Um, and how do we balance that? I, I'm not sure. Um, so birtherism, right? Like, do things get debunked? Because even after you get an apology, well, I mean, it, it was kind of a winking, a, lot of people, a winking, a winking apology. apology. But a lot of people still believe it, right? Surveys. But but birtherism was never, you know, the idea that Obama wasn't born here it was never about what it was about. Sure. <laughs> so to kind of like say right. like, can we disprove that? You know, like that right. is ne there's never going to be a proof enough mm -hmm. to say that a black guy belongs. Right. 
And, and if we start with kind of that troubled um, idea, uh, I think we'd be better off. I mean, you know, if Morgan Freeman can't have convinced us that there are black presidents, then how can Obama? I mean, you know, I, I think that there's this kind of uh, weird fact of that. And I, I end up writing about that in uh, my review of Ta-Nehisi Coates is, um, we were eight years in power because I was really interested in this black president idea. Mm -hmm. um, and so is he, you know, he's really fascinated about that. And then I think the thing he said most powerfully in that book is that Trump is the first white president, mm -hmm. he says. And what does that mean, right. you know? And um, that these two things go together right. and one follows the other. The thing that um, really convinces me of what you're saying, right, that it's obviously never really about the birth certificate or where he was born, is that Trump said at the time, because he's number one birther, okay, well, I'll pay, I'll give a charity this millions of dollars if you show me your transcript. Right. Right, because you're an affirmative action president, and that's how you got in. Well, awesome. and also then the same person won't show their taxes. Right. So it's never about what it's about. I mean, it's about power. And I mean, I said that about plagiarism, too. Plagiarism is about power. It's about aspiration. There ends up being a lot of uh, Harvard <laughs> plagiarists that I talk about. Um, and what interests me is only the, that seems the only explanation for something like Melania Trump uh, plagiarizing Michelle Obama's uh, speech. I mean, that's right. the most crazy moment right. that would have sunk anything else, but it was, you know, like she didn't own her words. Mm -hmm. um, and that was because, it, it, but it's also more nefarious than that. I can steal from you, but also I need to steal from you. Mm. Um, that's a really deep moment. Yeah. Um, so I work with, I've worked with youth in different capacities, and I'm also just thinking about what that means in terms of like history that's being taught. I'm thinking of, um, how so much of our education systems, like in history classes, it's completely like whitewa whitewashed versions of what slavery looked like. Sure. And that idea of our education some system can sometimes be a hoax in itself and that not everything is relevant and true. And I'm thinking of how I hear from students or people in general, oh, racism has ended, slavery has ended. And when you look at the incarceration rates of you know, sure. African men, how much, you know, how much there is. Um, so I'm just thinking of your thoughts on that and how youth, or even for me, I think about how to go navigate about unlearning these things and yeah. unlearning these hoaxes and trying to better understand the truth of it all. Yeah, it's a big question and a good one. Um, you know, I work at and direct the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, and I feel like there's many uh, reasons for it to be, but its initiating um, reason was that one of our founders, Arturo Schomburg, was told as a young man, he's black Puerto Rican in Puerto Rico, that there was no black history. Mm -hmm. uh, and he sought out to prove that person wrong. He, he amassed 10,000 vindicating evidences, he said. And, um, but what's interesting is he also is trying to go beyond what he calls this, the idea of firsts, you know, which I think sometimes we reach to, to explain. But I, I don't think we should, you know, it's a tough thing because I, what I love about Arturo Schomburg is what he, when he writes about it, and the Negro digs up his past, his famous essay, which you can get online pretty easily. Um, he's thinking in the 1920s about some of the same questions that dog us now, why we should study the past, why we should know it. And for me, history is the way to kind of help people navigate. And what you're saying is what if history is, is taught as bunk, and what if history mm -hmm. is falsified? I think that's all the more reason you ha we have places like Schomburg, which now those 10,000 items are 10 million items. And we have there evidence that you can see for yourself. And you know, I sound a little like Barnum. But um, <laughs> you know, uh, for, for uh, different reasons, you know, yeah. like you come see the documents. Um, you come and study for yourself and see. And I think it's so important for young people to see their history, not right. just you know hear about it or read about it. Mm -hmm. um, that unmediated kind of history, I think, really speaks to them. Now, what I think libraries and archives like Schomburg do are provide context for that. So when we have a discussion, a, 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 a conversation about race, that whole you know century almost of history, 93 years we've been in Harlem since 1925, 
speaks to. So when people come and we have a black comic book festival, it's not like we just invented black heroes, you know, last week uh, or with Black Panther. Or, and in that, when we were having the black comic book festival, people went upstairs to see the Black Power uh, exhibition and saw actual the Black Panthers from the 60s, you know. And that kind of history, I think, is so important for people to see firsthand. Um, it gets me <laughs> excited because I see what happens when you put a kid who thinks they're not part of a history book. Because there's two ways history books, I think, can screw with us. One is you're excluded. One is you're included but so unimportant that you think you're, I mean, it's almost worse. You mm -hmm. know, like, uh, you know, when, when Arturo Schomburg was being told that, he could prove instantly you're wrong. Here's two books. You're wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but when you have a book that is artfully trying to, you know, disenfranchise you from within. Uh, I do think you have to work a little hard, but I also think it's important to go to these places, and I hope there's one near you where you can take folks and show them this history. Walk around Boston is a place filled with everything from Phyllis Wheatley to Crispus Attucks mm -hmm. uh, way back when who speak to these long history of revolution and change. Um, so, uh, you know, how we're working on, for instance, a hip hop curriculum. Um, and I think that's gonna tell, help young people where they are think about this history. Um, and so, you know, to me, it's, it's a combination of show them the past, but also connect to them in their present and where they live and help bring them. Uh, that's how I learned and came to it, because a lot of what I learned, I didn't learn in school. Right. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Hi. Uh, this question is uh, kind of for both you and Professor Bell, um, and goes along with that question. Um, I guess, like, it, um, if we, if you look at some of like the political science literature, it's a little bit more pessimistic about presenting facts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to uh, countering hoaxes. Yeah. So how uh, do we draw people into like the things like the Schomburg Center, or maybe some people who are more resistant? to listening to the other side? Like, uh, well, I mean, or is the point of history to try to convince people who don't want to be convinced? I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, well, no, that's a part of my question. Is like, is it even uh, worth trying to get some people just totally unreachable? And, um, the, and, I, and my other question, as somebody who studied poetry, is, uh, how is this book, if at all, has it informed your, your writing of your poetry now? Sure. We'll start. You can answer that first part. So some of the political science literature has been really uh, pessimistic about the possibility of persuasion happening. Um, but there have been recent studies that have shown that there are strategies. So sometimes the presentation of facts over and over again that um, are contrary to somebody's prior beliefs uh, makes people dig in further, right, um, because they feel defensive. Um, of that. Uh, but there are other times, right, and there are strategies. Um, as Kevin said, you need to present, if you're going to repeat the lie, first of all, repeating the lie can reinforce it. But if you're going to repeat it, you have to frame it as a false claim and not as, you know, a claim that's, that's made. Um, or um, Lakoff, who's a con cognitive linguist, suggests that rather than repeat the claim, you could just actually say what the truth is, right? What a replace. crazy idea. That's insane. Yeah. And so rather than spreading and reinforcing, reminding people of the false claim, you talk about uh, you know, Obama being born in, um, in Hawaii, right? And, and his biography. And just you, you, say, you tell the story that doesn't you know, remind them, oh, you don't believe this, right? But you, know, you're, you just sort of like, you don't confront the sure. thing that. Um, is causing the problem in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about this sometimes with Bunk because, you know, it's a book that I hope by the end you, you know, I wasn't just trying to convince someone who didn't believe uh, the story. I also was trying to uncover a story that might not have been known. Um, and I had the sort of experience, and maybe I wanted to kind of recreate that, of starting out thinking, well, maybe the hoax it seems to me a lot about race. And by the end, I was like, oh my god, not another racial hoax, you know? And like, or a hoax that, you know, it seemed like the same thing by the end. Mm -hmm. um, even in places that seemed far, far flung from it. 
Um, and so I wanted to kind of recreate that feeling, and it was important for me to structure the book so that people understood and discovered with me. And I guess that's another way of how I try to frame these things is, you know, not just um, here it is, you, you need to believe it, but also like here's how to discover it. And also teaching people how to discover things. What is a source? You know, here are the sources at the back, check, go. You know, here's some links. Um, I think you see this in a positive way with something like uh, the Charleston syllabus, say, where people are not simply saying like, um, here's this event, here's why it's bad, but here's also a context for understanding this event. And I'm not sure how much that works, but I think it's a really good effort and important part of it. Uh, in terms of my own work, um, you know, I think poetry uh, and prose aren't so far apart. Uh, I don't know if I would have said that a few years ago. Um, I do think that what I like about Bunk, and people have said this to me, is that it feels like, for me, a poet's book in the sense that I'm making these connections between things that may not always be obvious. And uh, to me, that's what a poem does, is it takes one thing and says it is the other and is like the other, um, if not just makes that leap. And those connections, I think, are really important in what I tried to stress in both of the books. I tell you, it was a secret, helpful um, place of persuasion, though, that I think yes, might be controversial do. for you. Because uh, you, you mentioned the term edutainment, right, as oh, being I like this, this terrible thing. But I mean, Sesame Street is edutainment. Like, it actually. Oh, sure. uh, I mean, I love the history. word edutainment because Boogie Down Productions put out a record called Edutainment ah. in like 89. Okay. That, anyway. Uh, but, you know, people can use fiction, right? Fiction teaches. And people absolutely. can use fiction to, um, fiction sort of like reduces the barriers, reduces counter-arguing, so people aren't on alert. Sure. Um, I mean, I so, think it's not fiction, but a hidden yeah. figures. I think I that's, was going to say hidden figures is a It's such a persuasive yeah. film for yeah. me, you know? Absolutely. Like, I feel like uh, when I, I re-watched it recently with my son, and it, it just is an amazing, well-done film yeah. that sweeps you along. And if you don't feel anything when she's like, I have to go a mile to the bathroom, right. um, then maybe you have a piece missing, right. and I don't want to talk to you. Yeah, um, absolutely. But you know, like that's where I, I'm not against persuasion. Uh, quite the opposite. And in fact, the thing that I came to realize, and I argue in the book, is that not hoaxes don't just hurt facts, but they hurt the imagination, mm. and they hurt our ability to believe that something uh, made up can move us. You know, and we we tend it, it is kind of accompanies this autobiographical, biographical impulse that I think, especially as Americans, we have. Um, and you see it more and more, what sort of nonfiction means. And um, you know, there's nothing like a good story or a mm -hmm. good tale. And that's very American, too. And, and um, That has truth in it. That's yeah. sure. sort of the opposite. Almost. Well, that's what my first book's about. It's about the truth with an F. Awesome. Should we end with that? Do yeah. we have any more? We should end with the truth. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.